you, Nicole. And so our third and final speaker on, on uh, this first panel is Broderick Hussard, so Broderick Chow, um, who is a senior lecturer here at uh, Bruno University London, and we will be presenting his paper to five embodiments in Stanley Rothwell papers. So um, this is um, uh, a new, the, probably the newest part of this project, um, which comes from archival work that I've been doing at the H.J. Luther Stark Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, and so the first image that I want to show you, this comes from the Stanley Rothwell papers, and he's a British former miner, artist, model, bodybuilder, boxer, wrestler, writer, and physical educator, and he lived 1904 to 1986. Um, he was born and raised in Lancashire, near Wigan, um, Ashton and Makerfield, um, apparently. Um, and he worked as a miner before coming to London, where he eventually became an artist model for a number of prominent sculptors. So, um, his papers document a life of image making, and his body is captured not only by the sculptures that he posed for, but also hundreds and hundreds of photographs, which I, I pawed through them all. Um, and they span his teenage years, um, teenage years as a minor well into his 70s. And, and these are his photo albums, basically, but they're all photos of him. So it's a really interesting thing to, to be looking at. Um, so this photograph uh, depicts the action of Rothwell lifting two men at the Daily Mirror Sports and Social Club. So despite the photo clearly being botched, the error, I think, is really interesting because it captures traces of movement, the stages of Rothwell's arm as it hoists the men in the air, so he has them by a strap and they're holding on to it and he's lifting it in the air. Um, so in trying to capture movement, the camera is actually creating phantoms. A dialectic is created between the captured, arrested, mortified, and still image of the body and its dynamic, agential, muscular living process. So it raised a lot of questions for me looking at this. Uh, how does, does the still image function as evidence for a practice that's about the moving body? In what way are readings of physical culture and fitness determined by photographs? And how might an embodied research methodology be applied to something that's happened already? So the advent of photography was crucial for the development of physical culture. It enabled for the first time what appeared to be an objective representation of the human body as close as possible to life. So by photographing early bodybuilders such as Eugene Standow or Lionel Stromfort, the camera put the ideal body within reach of the ordinary man, and it originally was only men. The before and after photo series also evidenced transformation. But photos do something to the body. Uh, Susan Sontag writes that, quote, to photograph is to appropriate the thing photographed. It means putting oneself into a certain relation to the world that feels like knowledge and therefore like power, end quote. So for Susan Sontag, the photographing eye renders its subject as an object able to be appropriated and controlled. And we can go further than that and we can say that the camera is not just the technology object of objectification, but of death, and the photograph becomes a memento mori of a living present. The image, this image in particular, reminds me though, not of a petrified subject, but instead of the embodied performance that is being captured, the movement, tension, and gesture that really refuses to be arrested. So Roland Barthes uh, reminds us that posing for a photograph is also an embodied action, and he says, I constitute myself in the process of posing. I instantaneously make another body for myself. I transform myself in advance into an image. This transformation is an active one, end quote. So becoming an image is a conscious act. And I think that this active, agential reading of the photograph poses a challenge to some of the disciplinary optics that are implied in much physical culture scholarship. Um, so Rothwell's papers provide a striking reminder that to become an image is also to make an image. It's a dynamic process that is also an act of physical agency. So, I want to follow lines of practice, process, and becoming in his papers and attend to those moments of bodily intensity that are rarely preserved by archival material. Um, and I'm going to be using some of my, reflect on some of my experiences training to build on this premise, arguing that uh, practice and repetition while disciplining the body also contains the potential of resisting scripts um, that the body has learned. Um, so, what do we mean by discipline here? And I think, so Dikai is um, instant, you know, interestingly raised it in certain areas. And I think Michel Foucault's notion of disciplinary practices is so influential for sports studies. But a lot of existing physical culture research has sometimes decontextualized these concepts. 
So it reads the built body as a strictly disciplined one without admitting much space for agency or subversion. And this becomes a model of a socially constructed body. Um, and indeed, Foucault called, himself called the body um, surface, uh, surface d'inscription des événements, so like the body is the inscribed surface of events, which can translate in multiple ways. Um, the inscription paradigm views transformation through fitness as an ideological inscription of the self, without making space for the role of the embodied subject as an active participant in that process. So, however problematic, this paradigm is related to physical culture's heavy focus on visuality and the pose, and this goes all the way back to antiquity and the ideal bodies modeled by Greek and Roman sculptures. The concept of the sculptural is already in the discourse of physical culture, body sculpting we talk about, for example. And it's also a recognizable trope in the transformation narratives of 19th and 20th century physical culturists, where a chance encounter with Greek or Roman sculptures becomes an inspiration for bodily transformation. So consider the story of Charles Atlas. Charles Atlas was born Angelo Siciliano in Calabria, Italy. And in his bi biography, Yours and Perfect Manhood, he narrates how the raw immigrant material of Siciliano was then transformed and sculpted into an embodiment of the American dream. He immigrated to the U.S. at 11, and he was a sick, weak and sickly child who was constantly bullied by other people in Brooklyn. And one day, his English language class takes a trip to the Brooklyn Museum where he's captivated by the physiques of classical sculptures. So he asks his teacher uh, how he might become like them. And his teacher, Mr. Davenport, brings him to the YMCA. Angelo observes men working out with weights, and he's never seen that before. So he goes home, begins working out with weights that he makes himself doesn't say how. Uh, he reads the magazine Physical Culture and he sends away for mail order magazines. After a year of training, or less than a year of training in fact, 11 months, Angelo Siciliano is then big and strong enough to beat up the bully who tormented him. Um, he then changes his name to Charles Atlas, teams up with an entrepreneur called Charles Roman and becomes, who we know today, one of the most significant proponents of physical culture in American history and his mail order course of dynamic tension was marked in, uh, marketed by this famous um, seven panel comic strip, which was printed in the back of magazines and comic books. And I encountered it reading Spider-Man, like as a kind of re-representation of the same thing. So at face value, his transformation of body was also a transformation of his social identity. Um, and from this perspective, fitness becomes a kind of disciplinary technology that inscribes values of Americanness, virility, self-determination, whiteness, and assimilation onto Siciliano's body. Um, so the cultural uh, studies and film scholar Jacqueline Reich writes that Atlas's transformation constitutes, quote, a racial remapping of interwar Italian identity onto the muscled American male body, end quote. Um, and Similarly, she's supported by historian Lynn Luciano's contention that uh, Charles Atlas became the model assimilated subject for young working class immigrant men in New York City. But this linear chronology of the before and after narrative, I think, leads these scholars to ascribe a kind of problematic authenticity to the before self, as if the transformed body or the subject were somehow a false copy. And this can be seen in what Jacqueline Reich terms a crucial distinction between Siciliano and Charles Atlas. So she refuses to use the name um, Charles Atlas when she's talking about the, the, the Angelo Siciliano. Um, so in this reading, the transformed after just becomes a, a, a representation or a performance. And so the striking thing here is that it's very anti-theatrical. It's this idea that the performance is somehow bad. Um, but it's also really close to certain currents of anti-transgender politics um, because using the name Siciliano throughout her article is, is when speaking of the real person, uh, Jacqueline Reich is effectively dead naming, which is a form of abuse where a trans person is referred to by the name he or she was assigned at birth. Um, so this paradigm of bodily inscription, sculpture, activates a kind of instrumental reading of physical culture. Yet, in viewing the body only as a social sign, 
obscures the fact that it is dynamic, moving material, which is constantly laboring to perform these signifying gestures. So I want to explore how the act of participation of the embodied subject now might challenge this reading um, through uh, Rothwell's archive. Um, so Stanley Hallam Rothwell was born on the 28th of December 1904 in Wigan. In his late teens, he began working as a miner in his hometown of Ashton on Makerfield. And during the 1921 miners' lockout, um, so this is like the first miner strike, not the one in the 70s, but the, the one that's kind of been forgotten by history now. Um, during the 1920s um, miners' strike, Stan and his friends began training outdoors. So they did weightlifting, wrestling, gymnastics. And Stan, who was uh, rendered invalid for a number of years by a bout of diphtheria, um, improved considerably because if he wasn't working in a mine all the time. He was outdoors in the fresh air and he was doing exercise. So in 1928, he moved to London and owing to his physique, he became a pub bouncer. And then he spent the next few years as a wrestler and eventually became a physical education instructor. And throughout this period before World War II, he worked as an artist model for sculptors including Charles Sargent Jagger and Josefina de Vasconcelos. And many of London's public monuments um, to manliness, such as the figures over the door of County Hall, are modeled on his posing. So a lot of the statues that we are very familiar with um, are actually Stanley Rothwell, but nobody really knows who he is. Um, so presented in this way, Rothwell's life would follow a similar trajectory to Charles Atlas's transformation narrative. So in considered in relation to a history of Britain, his physical transformation, a weak youth turned strong man, embodies economic, social, and political transformations as well. Uh, Northern boy made good down south. Um, especially the shift from a manufacturing economy reliant on northern fuel production to an economy of financial and immaterial labor concentrated in London and the southeast. But I think to read Rothwell's corporeal body as simply constructed by or analogous to these social transformations is to pass over the dynamics of his life. What my earlier summary left out was that Rothwell was not only an artist model, but an artist. Before moving to London, he enrolled in an art college, at, uh, art course at Wigan Technical College, and he practiced painting and drawing throughout his life. From his numerous unpublished manuscripts, we know that he approached art and physical culture as the same thing. This attitude enables us to read the hundreds of images in his archive in a different light not as evidence of a body inscribed, but rather as something akin to performance documentation, full of tension, movement, and life. Um, so I won't focus on all of the aspects of the images, but just their relationship, I think, to time and temporality. Um, over a third of the archive is devoted to images like this, um, Rothwell's artist model. Um, we see Rothwell posing again and again for these sculptures that we then never see completed. Um, the repetition produces for the viewer a kind of constant, effect of constant preparation, rehearsal, deferral, indexing a different relationship to time that resists this trope of before and after. Uh, Julia Palladini likens the temporality of deferral to what she calls foreplay, the activity that projects forward to climax but resists at the same time this completion um, for the event um, that might possibly bestow its ontological status on foreplay is precisely that which would put an end to foreplay as such. So, Palladini connects this idea of foreplay to um, the notion of the amateur, and she draws on the original etymology of amateur in the, the phrase of love, um, which describes the condition of many theater artists who remain amateurs insofar as the product of their theater labor has not achieved the status of an event in the specific economy of the doing of something without it coming to completion. So this condition, of course, doesn't only apply to theater labor, but rather to precarious labor in general, which only becomes productive labor when it's consumed. And so from this, Palladini draws attention to the role that love, desire, and specifically pleasure might play in sustaining an activity without compensation. So she writes, just like in foreplay, what supports the doing of precarious labor can always be pleasure rather than finality, even if its time is always already projected towards a horizon of productivity. And I find this trope useful in considering the evidence of Rothwell's embodied life. 
His performances of the body, posing, wrestling, gymnastics, training, were in a sense a kind of foreplay, a way of refusing this temporality by which an artistic practice must end in consumption. So a pose is a muscular contraction, holding the body in tension for a prolonged duration. Um, we see this in his recreations of classical statuary, such as the Discobolus of Miron, um, or the Belvedere tor Torso. So in the Discobolus pose, Rothwell balances on one foot, right arm extended in front of him, left arm elegantly curved behind him, and the pose is meant to create the effective movement of a throw, but actually what it does when you see the image like this is read the movement as entirely contained within himself. The tension in his quadriceps produces striations down the leg, the flexion of the deltoid visibly separates the pectoral muscles while contracting his trapezius muscles. So this is a body pausing, contracting, coiling. It's not in the flow of movement, but exudes some kind of potentiality. And he writes about the physical demands of posing in his autobiographical manuscript, The Roads That Lead from Wigan Pier. He describes fainting at his first sitting at the Royal Academy. He says, posing is a painful job. Sometimes one has to stand hours in crippling positions when shooting pain strikes throughout one's body like a lot of hot wires being drawn through one's limbs, then numbness. It also demands fitness of an unusual degree to stand the cold. One cannot take liberties with oneself to keep it up and get a living from it. So the physical demands here, combined with the precarious nature of the work, must have pleasure as their reward. Or else why would you do it? <laughs> but what kind of pleasure? And I think the physical tension here suggests pleasure in the intensity of endurance akin to experiments with duration and performance art. But there is also, I think, a kind of supplementary pleasure that comes from the theatricality of the pose itself. Rothwell's pleasure comes from posing's place in the economy of representation, the fact that the pose is there to be captured. It's a possibility of reproduction as the image, the very thing that puts an end to this act of posing that gives the pose itself meaning. And theatricality then becomes the excess or remainder, the emphasis that marks Rothwell's posing as practice and Rothwell as an artist. Thus, the photograph um, is less evidence of a body transformed than documentation of an artistic practice of transformation. Um, so you can see further proof of this mercurial pleasure um, furnished forth by images um, that are marked candid in the archives. Um, it shows that Rothwell continued to pose in his free time, even when he wasn't being paid for these things. Um, in the 1930s, he performed for a short while with a vaudeville act called the Quo Vadis Brothers, and he, they specialized in hand balancing. Um, he continued to practice these skills, so you often did these outdoors, um, in swimming baths and parks. And here we see Stan basing a handstand with his friend Edwin Picton, who had moved down from Ashland Make Makerfield as well. Um, another series of photos taken in Kennington depict him as the flyer balancing from the hands of his friend Cliff Attenborough, who also posed for many sculptures. And he would also perform overhead lifts with tourists and swimmers at the Serpentine when it first opened. And he wrote, It did not matter how big or fat they were, I used to hoist them over my head for souvenir snaps. <laughs> So no, when no other people were available, Stan would simply just pose alone, performing handstands, lifting weights, or simply showing off his physique to the camera, as in this 1904 photo that shows him at his most muscular, captioned, Blackpool was mine in those days. So this theatrical pleasure of self-representation cannot be understood by notions of narcissism, inscription, or social construction. I, instead, I think it's a performance of a self-made, embodied subject flexing and contracting time and history. So transformation, I think, what, what Rothwell's papers establish is that transformation isn't just social construction, but a dynamic, lifelong practice. Um, and I want to conclude by reflecting on my own practice life of training in response to this archive. So my colleagues in uh, Brunel have often looked upon my weightlifting with some amusement, <laughs> um, unable to reconcile the stereotypically meat-headed practice with uh, my working life. Um, and sometimes it doesn't work out, like, you know, uh, Christian said to me the other day, have you been doing lots of office work today? And I said, yeah, because it's, it's just two different sides of what, what happens in life. Um, so it's not really a dualist separation, I think, or not only a dualist separation of intellect and body, 
because you see, you wouldn't see a similar response to people who do um, singing or dancing. But there is something about the sneaking out during the working day to this building to train that feels furtive, like a kind of shameful secret. Um, among friends and family, my training is often treated with cu curiosity. Um, how can I justify training five two-hour sessions a week? Um, so more than ten hours in a week, uh, more than one working day. Um, as the journalist and CrossFit devotee Daniel Kunitz points out, quote, the impulse to overcome yourself, to continually remake yourself in pursuit of a better iteration is never entirely normal, end quote. Um, so I've tried to rationalize this way of listening. So number one is research. <laughs> I don't go to the gym, I train, I'm an athlete, it's a sport, it's not like I'm doing bodybuilding for God's sake, and hey, I'm in better shape now than ever. But such justifications ultimately fall short. So although I've competed, having started at 32 means I'll never lift huge weights. I've certainly gotten stronger, but it's also hugely taxing on my body, requiring con constant maintenance to keep the muscles and joints mobile and flexible. And since starting, I've put, put on at least um, 10 kilos, but I don't display any kind of hyper lean conditioning of some athletes. So, what do I want to get out of weightlifting, people ask me, and I don't have an answer. The training isn't for anything. There's no event that would bring this rehearsal to a completion and give it meaning. It's just practice. And uh, Danny Kunitz reflects on this with regards to his own participation in CrossFit. He writes, quote, We temporarily withdraw from the rush of existence in order to rehearse its most fundamental aspects, movement, the interplay of neuron and muscle, the presentness, presentness and oblivion of concentration, and, bettered by this training, slip back into the stream of life." End quote. So I agree with much of this description, but I want to resist this instrumental notion that is preparing me to go into society again. For me, the intensity of training is a desire and pleasure that uh, makes me want to pr uh, prolong this training, the pause, the contraction, and the pose. So, repetition in Rothwell's archive is part of a lifelong process of self-making, a life lived in rehearsal, even if his practice left behind its traces of his bodily performances, like statues and photographs. I want to argue that repetition, or reps, in the gym might be better thought not of as an instrumental activity that takes the body from before to after, but as aligned to a performance practice in the studio, something that searches for kinesthetic experience. Um, perhaps then the answer to the question of what do I want to get out of weightlifting is simply more weightlifting. So, rather than a conclusion, I propose an opening, a methodological challenge to historiography of physical culture and the body that starts by questioning larger narratives through which bodily transformation takes place. Could it be that in performing physical culture, Charles Atlas was not erasing his immigrant identity, but using his body to come to terms with it? Or that in taking to gyms, basements, etc., immigrant youth were not solving the crisis of masculinity, but rather working it out? Or that by documenting his physique across decades, Stanley Rockwell was resisting his own objectification? Such possibilities are unsaved by the archive, but, I suggest, persist in the potentiality of intense kinesthetic experience. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we only have ten minutes left for questions. If I invite um, Dekaya and Tiffany back, can we pull out some chairs? Yeah.